And all of God's people said, amen. I know some of you expected me to be on vacation. My dad got strep and cannot have his surgery until October 10th. Uh, my son Joshua had to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, yesterday morning, I was with him in the emergency room Friday morning, and then we went back again uh, yesterday. He's got an infection in his um, digestive system. And um, so uh, mom's sick, <laughs> dad's got strep. Uh, Joshua should go home uh, this evening or in the morning. Don't get mad because we didn't send out a, a lot of information. I have a philosophy for all patients, even my family. Uh, the less visitors you have, the faster you can get well. Amen. And so the best thing you can do is pray. Um, I can tell you that, that God's given me something to preach today and um, this morning and this evening. And so the preacher preached Wednesday night, Brother Terry, one more round. So, hey, let's uh, just stand up and go one more round. Amen. Because the devil's a liar and he doesn't want judgment house to happen. He doesn't like revival and he doesn't like it when the Holy Spirit convicts the pastor and the pastor gets right and the Holy Spirit says, forget about what happened in your past and you go forward with the ministry that I've given you and never talk about what happened in the past. Amen? Amen. So, one more round, choir? Amen. One more round? One more round? Amen. Amen. If you will, please stand. We'll be reading out of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5. Through six, The Word of God says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. Father, we thank you that you are the only God. Lord, you're the only true God. Lord, all the other religions that claim that they have a monopoly on you, they don't have a monopoly on you, God. You have a monopoly on you. On the universe. God, you are the main character. You are in the main, you are the main character of this cosmic rebellion that man has against you. God, this story, this truth that you have told, God, you're the main character. Father, your son Jesus is the hero because he gave his life on the cross and he raised from the dead. And the villain, Lord, that's the devil. He hates you. He hates us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God, you desire to rescue and redeem. And so today, God, I pray that we won't talk about faith. That God, you'll help us to pray to strengthen our faith. And God, I pray today, Lord, as we think about the many needs that each of us have. And God, the concerns that each of us have. That God, today, that you would meet every need in every heart. And that, God, we would see, we would see the truth of the gospel as it is sung and as, as it is preached. And, God, I pray for that lost person that, God, you would pull back the veil of eternity. And, God, let them see what is awaiting them if they reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, let them see a glimpse of hell. And God, let them sense the profound separation from your presence for all eternity. And God, let them sense your love for them. This hope that is found in this one mediator, Christ Jesus, who did give himself a ransom for all. And Father, we thank you that today that we will give your testimony at the proper time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pray for Judgment House. Guess we're so glad that you're here. And all of God's people said, Amen. We're fixing to sing Sweet, Sweet Spirit. And if you will, come over with me at this time. If you'll raise your hand, Miss Mira. For Miss Mia. I've only had about seven hours of sleep in the last three days. Miss Mia, they are, this is from four-year-old to sixth grade. They're practicing Christmas music. And it's always good to have Christmas in September. And all God's people said, Amen. look at your neighbor and say, let's go one more, one more round. Brother Johnny.
Give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Speaker. Good morning, everybody. So I think this is my third Judgment House year, and I've always been a guide. I enjoy being a guide. This year, I kind of opened myself up and said, well, if I'm needed for a speaking part, I'll do a speaking part. Well, <clears throat> I think God had it for me to do, be a guide again. So I graciously accepted that position, and, and I truly love it. Um, when Miss Jane asked me this week to come speak, I had originally planned to go to Huntsville this weekend to be with Clint, but he came home to see me. Amen. <laughs> so thankfully he did. Um, so I think God has laid it on my heart to share my testimony. You know, we're talking about testimony. So, um, and yes, Rick, I'm not going to try to cry. Um, many of you know my dad. Um, Before I joined this church, I was very broken. I had a lot of anger, had a lot of hate, and it branched out onto my family, branched out onto my kids, branched out onto my husband. We've had our difficulties. We've managed to stay together almost 20 years. Next year will be 20, and I mean, God has truly seen us through this. I mean, I think God destinies people to be together, and he and I are destined to be together. But before I became a member of this church, all of those things kept me from being the person I need to be with God. And watching people go through Judgment House, seeing the ones, because you see them before they go. You see them before they go into the Judgment House scenes. You see how they act, and then you see how it transforms them. And where I didn't know how to be a true Christian, I'm learning. Um, and it's through people like you who help us, you know, through Sunday school, through discipleship training. And it is truly about the relationship with God. I don't feel that God puts you in a place where you're not supposed to be. I feel like I'm supposed to be here. Um, I feel like where Clint and I are going is where we're supposed to be. God has made this a seamless transition for us, and I know that he'll be with us. But all the anger and the hatred that I felt and didn't know how to correctly express, I mean, I've had issues with my children, not necessarily Bailey, but my older child. A lot of you don't know, but she has estranged herself from us. And it breaks my heart because I have a granddaughter that I cannot see. And it's because she can't forgive. And when you harbor resentment and unforgiveness towards people, that anger builds in your life. And it can build toxic things. It can physically, it can manifest physically. It can manifest mentally. And it definitely can manifest spiritually. I feel like since I've become closer to Christ that my life has become more open. I'm not as out there like I should be, but I feel like I'm growing in that direction. I feel like if we can open our doors to people who don't know Christ, we're doing the best thing for them. Because Jesus is truly the answer, and he is the way, and he is the truth. And you just can't be peaceful and have love in your heart without him. To show compassion to people that you don't know, you can't do that without Christ. Because he shows us that's what's right. And I'm grateful for this family. I'm grateful for this church. And I'm grateful that we do this. And to watch people come in through the doors and not know what to expect. And then to see the people that I personally, going through as a guide, will pray for them. Because I see it in their faces that they're broken. And God can't help that. He's helped me. 
He's helped fix my broken, and God loves broken, and I'm grateful for that. Because the more broken you are, the more helpless you are, the more God's going to take you in and show you what he can do for you. And I think it's great that we can show that to people, and we can express that without any problems. So that's my testimony in a nutshell. Thank y'all.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. I appreciate these folks. Let me say thank you to this choir. It became, it sort of uh, changed from, well, actually we had Celebrate to join with the worship choir, and they became the revival choir this week. And they did a marvelous job of, of singing, leading our worship, as did our, our praise team and worship band. And those guys up there did a marvelous job with our sound. And I just want to say a thank you to all these folks who worked so hard to to make our revival music just something special for our folks. Had guest singers to come in. I hope you were here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night. Got to hear some some of their singing along with our own. It was just a, a great week of revival. The songs that we're going to sing and have just sung there are sort of a reflection of what God has done for us in revival this week. And uh, in fact, uh, this joy that I have is a song that kind of reflects on that. Because this joy that I have, the world didn't give it. And thank goodness the world can't take it away, amen? Right. so glad that the world cannot touch the joy that's in our hearts no matter what may come our way and we're done. I think our pastor touched on that this morning, Pastor Scott and also um, during the weekend revival there that uh, you know sometimes we get involved in our past and things like that and it affects our, our present and our future, doesn't it? But I think God wants to continue to do a work in our hearts and lives. You know I was telling, I was sharing this morning with our, our, our worship folks that uh, I think sometimes revival is a time where we, our spiritual compass gets realigned. You know, we got to get off a little bit here and there, and the world just begins to attract us so much, and we just forget about the things that we ought to be doing. We're doing good things, but we're not doing the best things. We're not doing the things that God's called us to do. And our spiritual compass, He just lines that back up, and He gives us back our true heart of worship.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that you did send your son, Jesus, Lord, that we may have our salvation and spend eternity with you, Lord. Lord, just forgive us where we fail you, Lord. Lord, as we take up these tithes and offerings, Lord, we just remember that it is all about Jesus, Lord. We're giving back by, for the love, love, Lord, that you command us to give, Lord, not because we want to or we think it'll further us anymore because... We know, Lord, no matter how much or how little we give, Lord, it don't get us into heaven. It's only by the power of the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, Lord, for us. But we give an obedience to your word and love for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I think of how he came so far from glory, he came and dwelt among the lowly such as I, to suffer shame. And such disgrace On Mount Calvary Take my place Then I ask myself this question Who am I? Oh, who am I? And who am I that he 
Thank you, Brother Johnny. I hope you're praising the Lord that you are one of the who am I's. Amen. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Genesis chapter 3. I know I put on Facebook 1 Peter 5. The Lord changed that uh, this morning. I will let you know this sermon that I have before me, I have studied for. Amen. Have I preached it before? Yes. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Amen. Two little boys at school. One went to the uh, Catholic church and one went to the Baptist church. So they sitting on the school bus and they said, you know what? A little Catholic boy says, you need to come over and spend the night. Come to Catholic church with me. Little Baptist boy said, okay, let me ask mom and dad. Mom and dad said, okay, no problem. Y'all go over there and, you know, play cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers. You know, go out and run around, get dirty instead of what's coming in the future when your children will be on a phone inside instead of getting dirt on them. Can anybody say amen? amen. So they worked it out and went over on uh, Friday, spend the weekend. Saturday, Sunday morning, they got up and went over to the, to the Catholic church and a little Baptist boy was watching, and man, they stood up, and they knelt down, and they did the sign of the cross, and they stood up, and they knelt down, and they stood up, and they knelt down, and stood up, and they left. 
Monday morning they got on the bus and the little Baptist boy looked at the little Catholic boy and said, Hey, you know, I really didn't understand what was going on in the worship service. He said, but I saw the priest. He kept doing this a lot. Well, what does that mean? He said, well, that's the sign of the cross. The little Baptist boy's 10 years old. He said, oh, okay. So they went to school and came up the next Thursday, next Friday, and they said, little Baptist boy looked at the little Catholic boy and said, hey, why don't you come spend the night with me this weekend and you can go to church with us. Okay, let me ask mom and dad. Worked it out with other parents. The next weekend, same thing. Got them, went to the Baptist church. Little Catholic boy really didn't know what was going on, you know. The, the Baptists, they stood up, they sat down, they greeted each other, they stood up, they sat down. And man, it was like, like Jesus size on Sunday morning. Can anybody say amen? <laughs> and a little Catholic boy, he noticed that when the preacher got up, got in the pulpit, he took his watch off and put it on the pulpit. Okay. They get on the bus the next morning, a little Catholic boy said, hey, I really like the... I really like the service, you know, man, the preacher, he, 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 you know, he got up and, you know, he kind of raised his voice and walked around and did all this. He said, but I got a question. He said, he got up and he took his watch off and he put it on the pulpit. What does that mean? And the little Baptist boy looked at the cat, little Catholic boy and said, that don't mean a thing. <laughs> that don't mean a thing. You know, it's hard to resist a good story. Amen. Judgment house. Is a good story. And in every story, there's a plot. There's a subplot or, or subplots. There's a main character. There's a hero. And there's a villain. Now, we are at the center of the plot of planet Earth. In fact, the plot of planet Earth is a cosmic rebellion in which we are at the center. You see, the plot draws you and the subplots keep you. And the main character, the, the hero and the villain, they keep you involved in the story. Now, in this cosmic rebellion where men and women and teenagers and children are at the center, God is the main character. Jesus is the hero and the villain is the devil. Jesus loves God. Jesus does the will of God. Satan hates God. Satan hates us, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God desires to rescue. Amen? Now, if you go ahead and put that first slide up for me. In Genesis 1 through 2, we know of the creation. We're going to read chapter 3 in verses in a minute. I'm not going to deprive you of standing up when God's word is read. Amen? In the creation, it said, the word of God says he created all things. And he said, all things were good. He made a perfect creation. Can anybody say amen? Everything that God made was absolutely perfect. And at the end of each day, God said what? It is good. He made a perfect man. He made a perfect woman. He said what? It is not good for man to be alone. But before that, God created man out of the dirt of the ground. Every one of us, whether we want to be or not, we're all dirt one way or another. Amen? Not dirt in a bad way. You know, we kind of use that as, hey, that guy's just dirt. No, dirt in a good way. Amen? And by the way, we're all 58th cousins one way or the other somewhere down the line. Amen? So if you, so if you Alabama fans don't want to be related to Auburn fans, you are whether you want to be and vice versa. And all the Auburn fans said... They don't even say, they don't even say amen. And all the Alabama fans said, amen. and all the Tennessee fans said, amen. and the Ole Miss fans, Mississippi State, <laughs> Kentucky beat Mississippi State last night. Can anybody say amen? I couldn't believe it, man. But God said, man's perfect, but he doesn't need to be left alone. And from the side of Adam, God took a rib and he formed the woman who Adam called Eve. Now, Adam had named every beast of the field. The word of God says he, he named everything. And after God put him in a deep sleep and took that rib and created a woman, she came to him and he went to name her. And I believe he probably said, whoa, man, because I've never seen anything that beautiful in my life. Can anybody say amen? But he named her Eve. And they had a perfect relationship. 
A perfect relationship. Their relationship was absolutely perfect in their work. They were absolutely perfect in enjoying God in their life. They were absolutely perfect. And they had their intimacy as God created between one man created a man and one woman created a woman. Amen? And the word of God says, and they were naked and had no shame. But God warned them. He warned them, you can have anything you want in the garden. In this garden, you can have anything you want. It's absolutely perfect. You can have anything that you want. But you, will, but you need to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. So in Genesis 3, I want you to stand, if you will, please, and hold your Bible over your head and repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It shows me God wants me because I am a who am I. Amen. So Adam is with his wife. And here they come. Here they come to the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not, you shall surely not die. That's the first lie of the Bible. Amen. Or in the Bible. And I'll just tell you right now, my, my eyes are not focused and I've lost what verse I'm in. What, what ver Did I just read verse 3? And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Father, we thank you that this does not have to be the end of the story on any of our lives. That God, we can be saved. And I pray today that Jesus will continue to be lifted up, that the cross will be preached, the blood will be preached, and God's sinners will be saved and Christians will will be exhorted. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. As you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, Pray for Judgment House. And so Adam's with his wife. He's with Eve, his wife. What happens? The devil lies. Now listen to the lies very carefully. Did God really say? Did God really say? We don't know what kind of tree it was. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. We don't know all the details. And a lot of times we get caught up in the details and we don't see the obvious. I see a lot of griping on Facebook. I see a lot of unnecessary things put on Facebook. I see a lot of political anger on Facebook. I see a lot of Christians going at each other's throats on Facebook and I just wish they'd get the guts and have a backbone to sit down if they have to talk about it, to sit down and have a civil conversation about their differences. I really don't care to look at it. I can't speak for anybody else. I just don't care to look at it because what's happening is that the devil is getting us caught up in all the weeds and we can't see the obvious. And I hope that Judgment House and Revival will bring us back to the obvious because right on the doorsteps of our own homes and this church, people are dying and going to hell because they are listening to the deception of the devil. Did God really say? If God can get you to doubt his word, he's got you. I mean, if the devil can get you to doubt God's word, he has you. If he can get you to doubt the scripture and the truth of the scripture, he can deceive you and get you to do anything he wants you to do. If he can get you to deny, deny the truth of God's word, he can deceive you and take you to hell because that's where he's headed. Listen to me. Don't ever deny the word of God. Don't ever deny the truth of God's word. Did God really say? Yes, God really did say. 
That if you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. You're going to die. But the devil says, will you really die? And the answer to that question is, somebody tell me, yes, you will die. Every one of us are going to die. Every one of us. Unless Jesus comes back in the rapture and takes the church before we die, every one of us has a date with destiny that we have a tombstone they're going to put our name on or we're going to go into a, a, what's that called when they burn you up? What's that called? Somebody tell me. Cremated, maybe they scatter your ashes over the, the Gulf of Mexico. I don't know. Doesn't matter after you're gone, but the fact of the matter is you are going to die. Have you thought about death lately? Have you thought about that there's a day that you're going to breathe your last? That you're going to stand before a holy God? And the only way you can stand in the presence of a holy God and be accepted into his presence and into the eternal, beautiful, inexplainable glories of heaven is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you thought about that? Not only do you need to think about it, but you need to accept it. Amen? Because the results of sin are death. The results of sin are destruction. The results of sin lead to complete shame. It is the tragedy of tragedies that every person from Adam from Adam to Eve all the way down to us is that we are sinners by nature and by choice. In complete shame. And so what did Adam and Eve do? What did they do? The Word of God says they went out and they made clothings for themselves because now they realized they were naked. They were in complete shame. The Word of God says in Genesis that God would come walking in the cool of the morning. And he would walk with Adam and he would walk with Eve. And they would have complete uninterrupted fellowship. But one day God came walking in the cool of the evening and he asked the question, Adam, where are you? God knew Adam's physical presence. He knew Adam's physical location. He's asking Adam, where are you in your heart? Where are you in your relationship with me? And he was trying to get Adam's attention to let him know, Adam, you are now lost. You don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're headed. You don't know what you have done. You don't know the consequences of what's happening here. So guess what, Adam? The damage is done. Sin damages. I don't have to preach about smoking cigarettes. The label on the package already says it. This product causes cancer. I don't have to preach about it. But I've tried to tell person after person, after hospital room, after hospital room, after hospital room, I've tried to tell people with emphysema and COPD over and over again, the best thing you can do for lung cancer, lung disease, is stop smoking cigarettes. But they just keep doing it. What you know will kill you, you should stop doing. Amen? Amen? And so the problem is now, sin is permanent. Adam is being told by God, asked by God, where are you? And in the question, he's telling him, the sin is permanent. You can't get out of it. The only way you can get out of it is if I provide a way for you to get out of it. And the Word of God says in Genesis that God made the first sacrifice for sin and provided coverings for Adam and Eve. Don't you dare believe what the liberals say. Don't you dare believe what some guy sitting in the think tank says. Don't you believe for one second. Don't you believe the lie for one second. There is no God. There is a God. And he provides hope for those who are found in sin. Amen. God did not give up on his creation. Aren't you glad? Johnny, thank you for singing that song. He didn't know he was going to sing this song. He didn't know I was going to preach this sermon. I didn't know I was going to preach this sermon. Can anybody say amen? I thought I was going to be in Doyleen, Louisiana at church with my mom and dad this morning waiting on a surgery. But God had different plans. I didn't know my mama was going to get sick. I didn't know my boy was going to have to be put in the hospital. But I repeat what Terry Long said Wednesday night. Let's go one more round. Can anybody say amen? The only way the devil can steal our joy is if we let him. 
The only way that we can get down and out is if we let the devil do what he wants to do with us. Listen, folks, the crisis is at its apex. The crisis is at its apex. God invades the problem with his son. Amen? Look over at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. What book? Chapter 4. If you don't know where Hebrews is, go right in the middle of your Bible. You'll find Psalms, maybe Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Keep coming to the right. And you're going to find Hebrews sooner or later. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. What's next? Somebody tell you. I'll tell you. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. What's after that? 1st Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy. And somewhere I think right after that is Hebrews. Can anybody say amen? The memory bank just gave out. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. And notice I didn't take you back to, I'm not going back to Genesis chapter 3 because we're going forward the whole way on this sermon. Amen? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are without sin. God invades the problem. And he sends his son, who is a high priest, that understands every weakness we have due to sin, yet he has not sinned. So that lets us know not only can he identify with us in our problems, he can give us victory over our problems because of who he is and what he has done. And not only victory over our problems, but victory over the problem that we all have, and it's called sin. You'll say, wait a minute, everybody's not a sinner. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Every, every person is a sinner. You'll say, well, I've never sinned. Yeah, you have. The Bible says in Psalms that what? In Psalms it says the ch- children go away from the womb lying. Oh, look at my perfect little angel, my perfect little baby. They're just so perfect. Everything's just perfect about them. No, it's not. They're liars from the womb. Yours, mine, everybody. I read Proverbs earlier this week. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will rid it from him. We're all sinners. We've all gone away from the womb lying. But the hope of the gospel is this. There is redemption. There is a buying back. There is a purchasing back of God, of those sinners. And it doesn't matter what socioeconomic, the socioeconomic lifestyle they come from. It doesn't matter what race they are. It doesn't matter how, how affluent they are or how not affluent they are. The gospel hope is that redemption is offered to every person. God did not give up on his creation. How do I know that? He did not give on, up on his creation because he wanted to purchase us off the sin block into a relationship with him. That's what redemption means. It means to purchase. It means to buy back. It means God saying what? That I will offer the price to purchase you for myself. You know what that price was? That price was his son. That's what, it, that's what the price was, was his son. It's a salvation by sacrifice. Listen, he lived like we cannot live as sinners. And he died a death that we could not die. He paid a sacrifice, Jesus did, that we cannot make. He suffered a death that we cannot suffer. You know Why? Because the sinner is dead in their sins. And they need somebody to bring them to life. And God, the main character, sends the hero, Jesus, into the story of the cosmic rebellion. And he says, I will give my only son as the purchase price so that my people can be saved. Basically, we have a ransom. We have a trade. That's what it is. God traded his son for you. He made a ransom for you. He made a trade of his son for you. I haven't had a child in the hospital since Caroline went in with the rotavirus at six months old. And I'm telling you, man, I could could have and would have willingly 
crawled in that bed and taken that rotavirus for her. In a heartbeat. I see my son. He's, he's over in the hospital. I'll go see him right after the day. It's probably it's been the whole day. I would gladly, gladly take that infection, crawl in that bed, take it from him if I could. Can you hear me, Dad? Can you hear me, Grandfather? A lot of preachers just are hard on dads and granddads today, man. We need to be lifted up. All the odds are against us in our culture today. All the odds are against us. We need exhortation. We need encouragement. We need to be lifted up from the pulpit. And the greatest example of a father that we could ever have is that he traded his boy for our salvation. He traded his son's life so we would not have to die. His son went through hell on the cross so that we could have heaven for all eternity. He went with that blood, that divine blood, and cried out, It is finished, as blood drained down his body on that wooden pole, down on that dust, and every, every bit of dust, every splinter on that cross, every part of Jesus' body, all the way throughout creation, said, It is finished, paid in full. Everything has been done so that I can be traded off the slave block into being a son of the Most High God. Can anybody? say amen and you ladies out there he did the same thing for you that you could be traded out out of wickedness and be called a daughter of Zion amen he came to purchase look at Mark chapter 10 verse 45 we got three verses right there in front of you Mark 10 45 and then we'll go over to Matthew 20 28 I'm just going to read them and we're going to keep moving amen all right, it's 1127. I'm only going to preach about 35 more minutes than all God's people said. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's redemption. Matthew 20, verse 28. Are you turning there? Good, I am. I don't even have my Bible marked. I'm just turning with you. Amen. Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. In 1 Peter 2, verses 5 through 6, that we it began the service with, there is, there is but one man, one God. Well, I better just turn over there and read it because I can't quote it right now. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a what? A ransom for who? All the testimony born at the proper time. Have you thought about the ransom lately? You know what a ransom is? A ransom is a buying. I need money to let this person go. What word do you think of when you think of ransom? I think of hostage. And every person that's not saved is a hostage of their own sin and the devil. And God said, okay, devil, I'll give a price higher than you can afford. Don't you think for one second the devil's going to get the last word on creation and on, on mankind? Don't you think that for one second? He's not going to get the last word. God's going to get the last word on everybody's life, whether they go to heaven or hell. A lot of us don't like the scripture in Psalms that says, Where can I go to escape your presence? If I go into the heavens, you are there. If I abide on the earth, you are there. If I descend into hell, oh God, you're even there. Wow, that messes some of our theology up, does it not? But that's what it says. The devil's not going to get the last word in, in, in redemption history. Jesus is going to get that. Amen? And what you want more than anything else is to say, I don't have enough money to purchase anybody's life. How much is a life worth? Priceless. Priceless. You got some people that are trying to save crows and whales, and they're the same people that give money to help folk have abortions. Something's wrong. What's the price of a life? Jesus. 
What's the price of your salvation? The cross. What's the price of your eternal security to be with God for all eternity? The blood of the Lamb from the foundation, from before the foundation of the world, John the Baptist said. You'll say, man, I'm worth that much? Yes. Who wants me? God. Why does he want me? He loves you. I don't have anything to offer him. You're right. He wants you anyway. All I have to offer him is sin. All I have to offer him is a broken life. Samantha got it right when she gave the testimony. We should love broken. Because broken in God's eyes is something he can put back together for his glory. A past that can be forgotten and walked away from to a future that we don't know what's going to happen on earth. But we know what's going to happen in heaven. Amen? Don't you let the devil steal your joy. If Jesus bought you, he's going to keep you. His blood's not so cheap that he would buy you with it and not keep you for it. Amen? And so we have to see the bigger plan. The bigger plan is restoration. You're a new creation if you're saved. If any person's in Christ, what? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any person's in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. That's what we're doing in Judgment House. We're just telling a story about three different people. So at the end of the presentation, people can know that they can be a part of the new creation of God's original intention, which is a loving relationship with him and with others. Did you get all that? See, our relationship with God is vertical, and our relationship with one another is horizontal whether we're saved or lost. Does that make sense to you? So, what do we have to ask the question? How would you have to answer? How you relate. How are you related to God? If you're saved, you're his son or his daughter. And all these other folk that are saved, they're all your brothers and sisters. Whether you like them or not, you got to love them. At a First Peter 5 that I was going to preach, I had a little illustration in there about judgment house. Yeah, yeah, you're going to get aggravated. Yeah, you're going to get excited. Yeah, there's going to be some, some things you don't like. There's going to be some things that irritate you. But what is the bigger plan? The bigger plan is when they come out of watching that story and they come back here in this music rehearsal area and they hear the gospel presented to them and they have an opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ to come into his original intention of having a loving relationship with him and others. And so how I relate to you during the, during the production has everything to do with how somebody responds to the gospel what I like what I don't like and what irritates me and what aggravates me doesn't matter because the mission is not about me my wants what I like what I desire what I want it to be the result is people can have the gospel presented to them and my irritation is small compared to somebody being born again to the family of God amen how do I relate to people well, through the creation, the fall, redemption, and restoration. Go ahead and put that next one up. Who's got a cell phone with them? Hold it up. If you text it during church, put it down. <laughs> How many apps do you have on your phone? Just take a guess. 50 apps. 30? Anybody else brave enough? How many you got, Caroline? 30. Who doesn't care anything about apps on your phone? Let me see your hand. Okay. All right, so look, check it out. Check it out. A little, little, little principle here, a little lesson here. You, you have two generations in the church. 66. You have two generations in the church. Hey, wiser generation? Sooner or later, you're going to have to change. You're going to have to offer a service to reach young people. You're you just going to have to. You're going to have to. You're going to pay your debt off. The debt, the resources are in the harvest. 
Amen? You're going to have to. Gonna have to have two. I'm just telling you now. You're gonna have to have two. Somebody said, "Man, that's pretty brave on Sunday morning." Well, I mean, it is what it is. If you're gonna reach them. You're gonna have to. So we love apps. Amen. Go ahead and put those apps up. How do I apply this? Well, you apply it by sharing the gospel by letting every person know they're created in the image of God. Amen. And that every person is sinned. That God has a plan of redemption through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that plan of redemption goes back to restoration, which was the original intention of us being right with Him. That's the gospel in 20 seconds. Amen? So, lost person, what are you going to do today? God loves you. People in this church have problems. I ain't going to church because they're full of hypocrites. You know what? Yeah, you're right. And I'm the biggest one. I don't say that just to put on airs or say, oh, that sounds cool on Sunday morning. It's true. I don't have everything right all the time. I don't get everything right. I don't get, I don't get it right in my marriage. I don't get it right being a father. I don't get it right being a preacher. I don't get it right being a pastor. I, as just a Christian, as a normal person. But the result of salvation ain't up to me. Jesus took care of it at the cross. So what you going to do, lost person? Well, I don't want all those people looking at me. God already sees your heart. Who cares what we think? Because what we think is this. We want you to be saved. We want you to follow the Lord in baptism. We want you to become a, a member of the church so you can know what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we think. And you'll say, well, I really do care about that then. Because that's good stuff. Amen? What about you, Christian? You got somebody on your heart and mind needs to come to Judgment House, needs to tell, tell about the Lord. Very simple. You just got to write four things down. I'm creating the image of God. I admit I'm a sinner. I fail in sin. I confess Jesus with my mouth and believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead. And if I'll do that, he'll make me a new creation, created for good works in Christ Jesus. Amen? Pretty simple invitation. Amen? So it works the same all the time. Baptists, we're going to do it the same all, every time. We're going to stand. The music's going to start. The invitation is open. My microphone will be off. Brother Scott will be here. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to give any money. You don't have to quote any scripture. All you have to say is, hey, I'm coming for this. And you already know what I don't do. I don't do the raise hand, look up, try to talk you down the aisle. Because if I can talk you into something, the devil can talk you out of it. But if the Holy Spirit convicts you and leads you, the devil can never take that. Amen? Father, we thank you for this day. This is your invitation. We pray that you will do among us what seems good to you. And, Lord, I know your heart beats for those who are lost and that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them know that this is a place of grace and mercy. God, this place is not a place of judgment. This is not a courthouse. And so I pray, Lord God, that even today they would come and repent of their sin and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord, continue to convict us and let us be who you want us to be. Lord, I, I don't want to pray this, but I'm going to. I don't know why Dad's sick. I don't know why Mom's sick. I don't know why Joshua's in the hospital, but you do. And you told me to praise you in all things. So I'm going to praise you for what I can't see and what I don't know that you're going to do. But I know, Lord God, that those who love you and are called according to your purpose, that you have good things in store for them. So let us follow your will. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. If you would stand together, please, for our time of invitation. Brother Scott and I will be here. Lost man, come now. Lost lady, teenager, child, come now. Christian, come to this altar as God leads you even today.
God's people said. Amen. I'm not sure who our deacon is to close in prayer after uh, Blake Woodham makes an announcement for Judgment House. Brother Rick, please close us in prayer. and then Brother Rick. I just want to announce also today is the last day that if you want a Judgment House t-shirt, sign up is in the foyer and this is it. So please come by and sign up for a Judgment House t-shirt. Brother Rick. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for loving us so much, Lord, that you sent your, your only son, Lord, to pay our ransom so that we may have a relationship with you and have